or either email her and call her. These slides, so um, in your good and bad, there are, uh, there's a lot of information, and what you'll see is a website that says cancer.northwestern.edu, and that's where most of you register. So on that website for Cancer Connections, you'll see um, these slides posted. So you have all of her information, and like I said, she, she's happy to talk. <laughs> um, so our next speaker is Dr. Judy Case. She's going to be talking to us about when you or someone you love has advanced cancer. Dr. Case is the director of the Cancer Pain Program in the Division of Hematology and Oncology, a research professor of medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, and a full member of the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. Much of Dr. Case's clinical work is centered on the relief of pain associated with cancer and HIV, and she's traveled widely to educate healthcare professionals and Western about cancer, pain relief, and palliative care. Dr. Case received her bachelor's degree in nursing from Elmhurst College, her master's in oncology nursing from Rush University, and her PhD in nursing science from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Please help me welcome Dr. Case. Thank you, Miriam. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for taking time. I realize it's a, a lovely day, and I'm so excited to see you all here. And I'm going to apologize. I didn't bring food. So Mary kind of stacked the deck a little bit here for us. So I've got some things that I want to share with you this morning. Um, a little bit about the history of cancer, a little bit about some of the stigma that we face when someone has a diagnosis of cancer, and then I want to give you some very practical tips if you are the person who has advanced cancer or you love someone who has advanced cancer. So I hope when you walk away from our 45 minutes together that you will have some very clear resources and supports. So a little history. Now, Miriam asked me to talk about this, I think, because I'm old. Um, you know, they always ask the gray-haired person, well, okay, better living through chemistry, but they always ask the person who's been around the block a few times to reflect back on the history. And I do have to say, having been an oncology nurse from the very beginning of my career and through this entire 30-plus years, we have seen some outstanding evolution. It's really amazing. For those of you who love to read or would prefer to watch, the uh, book called The Emperor of All Maladies was made into a PBS special that aired just this past year. You can get it on the PBS website and stream it. It is really an amazing resource that will give you a fascinating historical perspective. And all of these slides, by the way, I see some of you taking pictures, which is perfectly fine, but all of these will also be on the website for you. So, this, these next two slides give you a very quick overview. Now, I was not around in 1900. I'm not that old. But I will tell you, at that time, so it's just a little over 100 years ago, the only thing we really had to fight cancer was surgery and the evolving beginnings of radiation therapy. And it was pretty crude at that point. And then we started to refine those techniques and then see the beginning of chemotherapy administration. Now, the story about how chemo started is really pretty fascinating. During World War I, some of the sailors who were transporting nitrogen mustard, mustard gas, started to notice changes in their lymphoid tissue. And that led some clever scientists to say, now maybe this might help treat a cancer called lymphoma. And it did. It did help shrink those tumors, but it was a not a very sustained response. And so each new finding, each new discovery, advanced our ability to provide longer and longer survival. And as you can see here, we started to see more and more chemotherapy. Now there's a little funny thing as an old nurse. When I first started my very first job, we used to have to have drug cards. They were little index cards, and we would write out every single drug, and we would carry them around. And yes, you can tell I'm old. Um, we had like a half a dozen chemotherapy drugs. That was in 1979. Now, the numbers of drugs, if you had index cards for every single one of these agents, you'd be carrying around a huge backpack. 
the, the numbers of treatments in our armamentarium have dramatically expanded. You can see some of them listed here, anti-tumor antibiotics, anti-folates, and other agents. And then in the 60s, we started to realize cures. And it started with some of the liquid tumors, like some of the leukemias and Hodgkin's disease, and we saw real honest to goodness cure. And then the very first solid tumor where we saw a cure were the testicular cancers, again in the late 60s. And then we started to see the advent of adjuvant chemotherapy, where we realized one drug alone isn't good enough, yet we probably need to have a recipe or a menu of drugs together. And if that regimen provides some relief for a while, and maybe it doesn't provide any additional relief, then we change to a different recipe or regimen. Then, more recently, we started to see these amazing monoclonal antibody-type drugs, drugs like Gleevec and others, where we've been seeing really amazing sustained survivals. So that's a very brief historical perspective. I can tell you, in addition to seeing amazing control of tumors, the other amazing change that we've seen has our ability to manage symptoms has been so much better. In 1979, the best we could do for a lot of the chemotherapy that caused nausea was to give someone a bucket and to sedate them to hope that they would sleep through the next day or two and have minimal nausea and vomiting. Nowadays, we've got tremendous drugs. And so for most people, we don't see this as, as the enormous problem that it was decades ago. But we still see some myths and some stigma related to cancer. And I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room right away. This is the one that everybody thinks of when they first hear the word cancer, that it equals death. But if we look at the world today, there are 14 million people in the United States living with cancer right this minute. And you all in this room are a perfect example of that. But that's one real hurdle that we need to overcome. Cancer has become a different kind of disease. It is more like heart disease, more like diabetes. Yes, there is no cure for diabetes, but we can control it, and people can live normal lives with this disorder. The same is true with heart disease. In many situations, we cannot cure heart disease, but we can control it with medications and with procedures, and people can live good lives, full lives with these disorders. And now cancer has become a disease like these. There's also the stigma that somehow it was your fault. Something you did made you have cancer. And that's a huge burden. And it causes a lot of guilt for people. Someone I love right now had stage four non-small cell lung cancer. And as I tell some of my friends about this, the first reaction I hear is, well, did she smoke? And I have to say, on my bad days, I think, really? I wasn't telling you this so you could blame her. But on my good days, I get it. We all kind of want an answer, right? We want to be able to point to something. Well, she got that cancer because she smoked, or he got that cancer because he drank, or they got that cancer because they were overweight or didn't exercise, or this whole giant list of things, right? Well, there was an amazing study that was released this year in Science, one of the most admired, the most important of the science-based journals. And what this study found is that about a third of cancers can be attributed to some sort of lifestyle issue, right? Maybe smoking, maybe genetics, maybe your work history, being exposed to different chemicals. But on average, two-thirds of the cancers that occur are really related to bad luck as the 
investigators termed it. It's related to genetic changes that as the cells divide, there are some mistakes in that division. And this is going to happen as we get older and our cells have been dividing more and more and more. So for some people, this brought them some comfort that, you know what, this wasn't my fault. And honestly, it isn't anybody's fault when they get cancer. So I wanted to just address that history and those stigmas because they are so profound and they do serve as barriers for open and honest communication about this illness. So what I'd like to do now is to share with you some advice for those of you who are living with advanced cancer and for those of you who love someone who has advanced cancer. So let's talk a little bit about some strategies that you can employ. First, educate yourself. Now, that sounds like an awful lot. Here you are trying to figure out our crazy vocabulary in healthcare. Who are all these people that I'm talking to as I come to the clinic? How do I make my appointments? What about my insurance company? What about my job, my family, all these other things? It can be pretty overwhelming. And I'm not suggesting that you become an oncologist, although at times I bet you feel like a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, a dietitian, a social worker, and all of the above. But do learn as much as you can, and I'm going to share with you some resources that can be helpful. But one thing that's really important to think about is use your resources, and your primary resource is the team. So you already saw what an amazing amount of information Mary has. She shared with us lots of crucial information about the diet and about taste aversions, and about how you can help overcome some of your symptoms. Always remember that you and your family are at the core of this team, and that we should be working all around you to help you. You are the center of this team. Now, who are some of the people, for those of you who have just started entering our, our system, or any healthcare system? Well, clearly they're the doctors, they're the nurses, there are people who are called nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. They serve as the doctor's right-hand man. There are going to be times when the doctor isn't in the clinic. You need to see someone. It might be the PA or the NP. And these people have enormous experience and education. The social workers can help you not only with addressing some of the coping issues that you might be struggling with. They are excellent counselors. They also have an enormous wealth of information about navigating the insurance company issues, helping you to identify where there might be supports in the community, both financial supports and other kinds of emotional support. The medical assistants in our clinics, they're the purple people, the people who take your blood pressure and weigh you each time, and those people are vital to what we do, and they're often your first contact. They're amazing. Don't neglect that they have a lot to share with you and offer. Our pharmacists, who are often in the background, except when you go to your retail pharmacy, but they have lots and lots of information about the medicines. And they'll help you know if there's any drug-drug interactions. Many people come to me with questions about that. We have psychologists and psychiatrists in our clinic to help people. And I'm often telling the folks that I see in clinic, these are not for crazy people. They're for normal people going through crazy times like cancer. And their job is to help you find the inner strength that you already possess, that you've developed during your lifetime, to use that strength now as you're facing a new challenge. We have chaplains. And no, they're not going to try to convert you to their respective religion. They're there to address you as a human being. What are your concerns? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? And we have lots and lots of community resources, and you've seen some of those folks out here. And please do visit them, and I'm going to share with you a few more as we go on. That you've got a whole cancer care team who are behind 
the curtains. You don't even see them. The folks who help get the prior authorizations for your scans and your chemotherapy and all that kind of stuff, the people who do the scheduling, all of those folks, we're all here to help you. So use us. Reach out to us when you have questions or concerns. Some other things that you want to educate yourself about. You want to know about clinical trials. You might be offered the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial. So do ask questions. And we've got folks from the Cancer Center who can define for you the benefits and some of the concerns associated with being in a clinical trial in your case. What about radiation and chemotherapy? We do use radiation to relieve symptoms. Excellent way to manage when the airways get blocked up and you're having some trouble breathing or to reduce bone metastases so that you can be free of your pain and move more fully. Palliative care, we have an outstanding palliative care team. We actually have multiple teams, the inpatient side and in the outpatient side. And they're an interdisciplinary team that works with your oncology team to help address some of your goals of care questions and your symptom concerns. And then hospice care, a really important component of any type of care delivery. So some of the things you need to do to educate us. So you've educated yourself, but you need to help us too. I can look at all of you out here, and I've worked in pain management for 35 plus years now. I can't tell who's sitting there in front of me has pain. You have to tell us if you're experiencing pain or nausea or many other symptoms. We just can't see it and there's no x-rays that tell us if a person has pain, no lab values. So inform us so we can better help you. What about anxiety? There's lots of things we can do to help you if you're experiencing that difficulty with getting your emotions under control or People tell me, you know, they fall asleep okay at night, but they wake up in the middle of the night. And one patient told me recently, and I thought it was really clear, it was a good description. She said, my monkey brain turns on. All of those, what if? What if? What if I can't pay the bills? What if? And then it starts to just get out of control and you can't get back to sleep. Constipation, they call me the pain and the poop nurse up on the clinic because the medicines I give sometimes cause constipation. So I try desperately to prevent that. Because the last thing you need is pain here and pain down there. So all of these symptoms you need to help us know. Okay, so educate us. Also, as we communicate with you, as your disease changes, it's helpful for you to be upfront and honest with us. Some people want to know everything. Other people, not so much. So let us know what your communication style is. In some cultures, people don't want to know or shouldn't know, but their family should know. So talk to us about that. We, we won't be offended. We're, we're pretty thick-skinned. Let us know your preferences. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. And let us know what your family's needs are. If one of your children is really struggling in school because of your diagnosis, there's things we can do. Our social workers are brilliant. They reach out to the school, and they help with the teacher so the teacher can understand better what your child is going through or your grandchild is going through, and can even give presentations to the school or provide support materials. There's amazing resources out there. So it's not just you, like I said before, it's your family. The other thing you need to do is express your feelings. Again, you're not going to hurt our feelings if we know you're sad. Sometimes people feel like they've got to come to clinic and put on their makeup and make their hair look good and show their best face. If you're not feeling that way, you tell us, because lots of ways we can help you address that. So. Some of the feelings that people have, that new movie, Inside Out, right? I think that's what it's called, right? 
I have to borrow some of these little kids so I can go to the theater and not be weird. Um, sadness, grief, denial, anger, stress, fear, guilt, loneliness. All of those and many, many more are common emotions when you're diagnosed with cancer and when you're living with advanced disease. Don't be afraid to tell us. We won't be offended and we can help. In fact, there's a beautiful me metaphor that someone shared with me when I was going through a tough time, and I share it with patients all the time. Sometimes people are afraid. They kind of suppress those feelings, either anger or sadness. It's like, I don't want to let those out, right? And remember, Pandora was told, don't open that box, right? People feel, maybe you grew up in a household where you weren't supposed to express your emotions. Maybe you're a guy and you were told, in our culture, men don't express emotions, right? Kind of like Pandora, don't open that box. But what happened? She opened the box and out flew all of these furies, all of these evil, evil entities, right? And they, it was horrid, it was awful, they all came out. But do you remember what was at the bottom of the box? Hope. So sometimes you're spending a lot of energy boxing in those emotions and if you just talk freely and honestly, hope is the final result. So, a few other things that you need to do to, as you're living with cancer. Take care of yourself. Exercise, move, eat, enjoy. I have lots and lots and lots of admiration for exercise. And no, it doesn't mean you have to run a marathon. It's what you can do. If it's chair yoga, then do it. If it's even just while you're sitting there watching TV, taking two cans of soup, exercising your biceps, you will sleep better. You will be more balanced. It improves your mood. There are all these wonderful positive results from exercise. So do keep moving. It's the most important thing. It improves your appetite. It decreases your stress. <laughs> And by the way, a lot of the wellness houses and cancer support centers have free yoga classes, free Tai Chi, specialized Pilates courses, exercise for, that's modified for your needs. Another important task for you is to reach out. Don't, don't try to do this by yourself. We don't give awards to heroes. Reach out to people you love, people you respect. Reach out to us. We can help. Another bit of advice I might share is to focus on what you can control. There are days when it feels like everything is out of your control. But there are things that you can control. Expressing your feelings helps to make people more in control. It helps you to feel less overwhelmed, and it frees your energy. There's some planning that you can do as well. You can organize your personal affairs, and this book is one of these amazing resources that I'd like to share with you. And we have many copies of this book in the Cancer Center. It's, um, from the National Cancer Institute. And if you aren't a patient here at Northwestern, you can get these from the NCI website, the National Cancer Institute's website, for free. It's a very thick monograph with lots of wonderful advice. So find your important legal documents. And, and frankly, some people would rather do this kind of very practical kind of work. The, the more emotional kinds of stuff can be difficult for some people. So start here. Start with the practical, easy, black and white kinds of stuff. Find out where your insurance papers are. Make it easy on your family. Look for your safety deposit box. Make sure the keys are accessible for your families. Look at your pensions, your retirement plans. In other words, get all this paperwork 
in order. You know what? Some people keep weight. That's kind of like, like I'm thinking it's like the end. No. Really, we should, all of us should have this all organized, regardless of where we are in our lives. But we put it off, right? There's other more important things. Now's a good time to get completely organized. The other challenge, I think, for all of us is those darn passwords. Get those organized, too. And then another important thing that you can control is advanced care planning. And there's a table out here with advanced directives. The advanced directives help us honor your wishes. Yes, it's a legal document, and it's all there for you. It's easy. It helps us to know that if for some reason you couldn't speak for yourself, who do you want to speak for you? Now, for those of you who are the loved ones in the audience, it's not you making the decisions for your loved ones. Don't feel like that. I know that's really scary and really overwhelming. What you're doing is helping us to know what your loved one would want. So if your dad goes into the uh, emergency room and can't speak for himself, would he have want, does he want that antibiotic? Does he want that tube to help him breathe if he can? You're not deciding. You're helping us know what he would have wanted. Do you see the difference? It's a little subtle, but the daughter knows her dad so well. And hopefully, that's the next step. If you decide that someone should be your power of attorney for health care, talk to them. Don't just cite it and then file it. Talk to that person. Let them know what your wishes are so we can indeed honor them when you do enter the hospital. So there's the durable power of attorney for health care. And that's an important person to allocate. Choose someone you trust will follow your wishes. Talk to them about your wishes. And this is not giving up, by the way. And there was just a study that was published from the University of Pennsylvania where they looked at 200 patients who signed advanced directives and they looked at their anxiety and their hope. Because some people are worried if you sign this, you're going to give up hope. They actually found there was no change in hope, and there was a little bit of a reduction in anxiety. What we often say is, hope for the best, plan for the worst. And once you've done that planning, now you can do more hoping. And that was really the truth in this particular study. And that's what I find. When people take care of a lot of these particulars, they can actually then spend more time and that brings us to the next thing that you control, your life, your legacy. How do you want people to know about your life? My mission in life has been to improve cancer pain management. That's been my professional mission. And so if I were going to write my legacy today, I'd write down all the things that I did about that. And I'd have my whole other legacy about my family and people I love in the world and those kinds of things. So look at the meaning in your life. You've been on this planet. You've made a difference. What has that difference been? It's to celebrate your life. This is not a legal document, by the way. This is something you do to leave for your loved ones. And also, to leave for yourself while you're here. What? And the meaning of my life, and what can I do to advance that meaning? And here's some things you can do. You can make a video, story of my life. For those of you who are expressive and like to, to do these kinds of activities, and by the way, for those of you who don't feel very high tech, this is a great way to get your grandkids involved. Put together photo albums, family histories, that leaves a legacy, family trees, journals. Recording funny stories, and by the way, for those of you that listen to NPR, you've probably heard StoryCorps. It's a neat little uh, hermetically sealed box 
where two or three people will go and record a story. Um, usually, like children will interview their mom and dad. Well, we are so lucky that in Chicago we have a permanent story for recording box. It's at the Chicago Cultural Center, and those get archived, and they're archived um, forever. So they um, uh, can live on, and sometimes they get played on NPR. You can write notes for your loved ones, write letters to the children and grandchildren, create art, all sorts of wonderful, amazing things. Plant a tree, maybe do that as a family. There's something called an ethical will. Again, this is not a legal document, but it's a way to help you reflect on your legacy and reflect on who you are and who you want to be. And it examines your past in your present, your lessons learned. It's a great way to teach your children, your grandchildren, provide the wisdom that you have to share. And here's a nice, interesting book that helps guide you through it. AARP even has some recommendations on their website. There are games that you can play as a family. So you have these little cards, and you can choose the card, and it'll say, recall a choice you made based on a personal value. Talk about an experience you hope to have. Share a memory about a person who made an impact on you. Highlight an accomplishment in your life that was greatly important to you. So these are some fun things that you can share with your family. So that's just a very quick piece of advice for you, a set of advice for you. Again, all of this will be on the website if you want to go back to it, because it was a lot of information. But these are some important steps, and they are reiterated in that National Cancer Institute monograph that I mentioned. Now, finally, for those of you who are caregivers, this is a hard thing to be a caregiver. You're living through this, too. Now, I know this is preaching to the converted. All of you in the room are never going to say these things. You look awful. Everything happens for a reason. Maybe it happened for the best. Everyone's dying. No one knows how long they're going to live. You could be hit by a bus tomorrow. And I have to tell you, I had a doctor say that to me personally. I was like, really? Um, you're so brave. Well, I don't feel brave. Um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. For those of you who are younger, I know that's a pop song. For those of you who are older, that is Nietzsche, yes. And, you know, Nietzsche does have some things for, to guide us, but um, thank you so much. That's not what I wanted to hear today, right? God works in mysterious ways. Do you ever notice how we often blame God for a lot of these things? <laughs> Or God doesn't give us more than we can handle, right? So here are some things we can say. Because sometimes we feel pretty helpless. And words do seem pretty meaningless at times, or they just don't seem very potent. So tell me what's helpful and what's not. Tell me if you want to be alone. And tell me if you want to come. I'm really glad to be there. I really enjoy being in your presence. But if you need time to be alone, I get it. Tell me what to bring. I'm happy to bring that casserole that I always make for you. But if you're really sick of it and there's 10 of it in your freezer, would you tell me so I don't make another version of it? And tell me when to leave if you're too tired. I get it. I won't be offended. So those are just a few examples. And for those of you who are caregivers, people who love and care for someone with cancer, there's a monograph for you, too. And there's a picture of it. It's when someone you love has advanced cancer, also from the National Cancer Institute. So also free. For those of you who are loved ones, you got to take care of yourself, too. You're in this for the long haul. And sometimes you're feeling just as much pain as the person who has cancer, sometimes even more. So you need to talk to someone about your feelings as well. Don't hold all of this inside. Care for your mind and your spirit and your body. Exercise. So do it with your loved one if you can. 
Connect with others. Get a little time alone, away from your loved one. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're abandoning them. Laugh. I'm a great believer in the power of humor. It's physiologically good for you. It opens up your lungs, and just mentally, it's the best thing in the world. Keep a journal. Write things down. Sometimes things that are really swirling in our mind and causing us so much distress, when we actually put it to paper, we can put it away. And you feel so much more relaxed and comfortable. Watch a movie. It's a great escape. It's a wonderful way to distract yourself. So there are lots of ways that you communicate with loved ones. Now, sometimes it gets really overwhelming especially for those of you with a very large extended family or a large extended group of friends. And with social media, it can be a wonderful way to help make your life a little bit easier. There are some amazing websites. This is just one example called Caring Bridge, where you as the caregiver or you as the person with cancer can keep a journal that others can read and you can even say, not up for phone calls today. But this is a way to keep your family, your extended family, connected. So that, for example, if you're in the hospital with neutropenic fever, you don't want to call those 20 relatives who are worried about you. You can put a post on Care and Bridge. Or for if you're the, the caregiver who comes home at the end of the day after visiting your loved one in the hospital, and you don't feel like answering those 20 voicemail messages, this is another way. And there's multiple websites. Caring Bridge just happens to be one that I'm aware of. So that's a nice um, way to keep everybody informed and keep their stress level. So I wanted to finish with, and again, all of these slides are on the website, but there are so many resources, and it gets overwhelming. And we just touched the tip of the iceberg. And I know that all of you have so many stories and bits of advice that you um, have, you can share as we've gone along. So here are those two monographs that I've mentioned. These provide a wealth of information. These are both from the National Cancer Institute. Coping with advanced cancer or when someone you love has advanced cancer. The American Cancer Society has amazing resources. For those of you who are being treated here at Northwestern, Miriam, who is the, our co-host today, is Miriam, stand up so everyone sees. Miriam is our individual who is our go-to for helping people obtain these resources. She's got a huge, I call it the surprise closet. She's got this huge closet with all sorts of resources. So go find Miriam. She's on the 21st floor, and everybody knows Miriam, so we can help find her. She can help you if you don't have a computer at home, navigate these websites. The National Cancer Institute um, has these websites, and that's uh, where you can obtain those monographs that I mentioned, and many, many, many more bits of information, either about your individual cancer or about some of the issues we've talked about today. Please, 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 if you live near any of these support resource centers, I tell everybody I see about these, and I really struggle with getting people into the door. And then once they're in, they're hooked. Two of the places are here um, with us today. So the um, Cancer Support Center, which is in Homewood, and they also have a satellite in Mokina. So those of you on the south side, and for those of you on the north side, the Cancer Wellness Center in Northbrook, and they have a satellite in Grays Lake. For those of you in the western suburbs, we have one in Hinsdale that's called the Wellness House, and there's one called Living Well in Geneva. These centers are so amazing. For those of you in Chicago, it's Gilded Club. It's more like a home environment. These are not clinics. They provide education. They provide mental health counseling like social workers, psychologists, support groups. They have yoga classes. They have nutritional classes, cooking classes. I know the one in um, Hinsdale has sleepovers for kids whose parents have cancer. Pizza night for the kids. 
just an amazing array of services. And you know what? They're all free. Some of them have acupuncture, Reiki, free massage. You know those are expensive. So go to the Robert H. Lurie Cancer Center website and you can find these and many other resources. The Life Matters Media, which was started by one of our doctors, Dr. Mulcahy, and the wife of one of our former patients. The two of them worked together because they felt communication could be better. And so this is really written with an eye toward helping people navigate the cancer system. So I want to thank you for listening. I know this was very hard to sit through 40 minutes. I want to end with this quote that I find so meaningful. What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. So thank you so much for listening to me this morning. You are truly the expert. We have a few moments for a few questions. Does anybody have any anything they'd like to share? Thank you so very much for listening. Take very good care.